Well, g'day and welcome to the channel. In today's video, I'm reviewing the Canon 200-800 to from the perspective of a wildlife photographer. I've bought this lens with my own money, I've had it for a number of months, I've taken thousands and thousands of photos, I'm going to compare it against the Canon 100-500, to the Sony 200-600. to I'm going to answer all the common questions you might have in relation to is it sharp wide open at 800mm? What's the f9 aperture like? Is that an issue in low light? I'm pretty much going to answer all the questions that you have or try to. And I'm going to share loads of photos that I've taken, loads of photos that you, my subscribers, have taken. I'm going to share their pros and cons, my pros and cons. I'm hoping by the end of this review, you'll be in a position to know whether this lens is right for you or not. Now this review is going to be extremely detailed, so I've put chapters in the bottom of this video and in the description, so feel free to jump down to a specific part. I've also released a number of in the field videos with this lens already, so make sure to check those out. Okay, so let's have a chat about the actual lens itself. It's a brand new design for Canon's RF mount, so it's not going to work on their old DSLRs. It's a 200 to 800 millimeter zoom range lens, and that is incredible. We've only really had the 100 to 500 for Canon, and that's just a little bit too short. We've all wanted a 600 millimeter lens like the Sony, but Canon ended up surprising us all by giving us a 200 to 800. There's pros and cons to that, which I will share, but me, I'm actually stoked that they went out and created something different. Having 800 millimeters is just fantastic. Now you'll see that it's white, and it actually looks like their L series lenses. So with Canon, we get the L series, which is their top of the range, and then we get the level below that. This isn't actually an L series lens. Even though it looks like one, the build quality feels like an L series lens. So what's different? Well, there's two main things that I'm aware of. The first one is this only has one autofocus motor, whereas the 100 to 500 here has two autofocus motors. And the other difference is the actual coatings that they use on these lenses. So the 100 to 500 has special fluorine coating on the front of the element that keeps off fingerprints and dust and grease and makes it easy to clean. Whereas the 200 800 doesn't have that fluorine coating. So it's likely you're gonna get more dirt and grime and they're just much harder to clean. I'm not sure why they left it out, but this lens doesn't have it. And the other difference is this lens has some special coatings for I think reflections and glare to reduce ghosting and chromatic aberrations etc whereas this lens doesn't have a lot of those coatings. So in theory this lens may be more prone to chromatic aberration, a little bit of ghosting and things like that. Is it noticeable in the field? Not really. I would have used this and you can't really tell. Unless you're pixel peeping, I don't think there's that much of a difference. So let's have a chat about the actual weight of the lens. Canon have done a great job at keeping that down. It's around two kilos, which puts it about equivalent of the Sony. So we've got the Sony here and the Sony 200 to 600. They're almost the same size, the same weight, which is great. With the body, it's about 2.7 kilos. So there is a little bit of weight there. You know, hand holding for long periods, your arms will get fatigued. But I shot this handheld nearly all the time and I didn't have too many issues. Now, clearly it is much bigger than the 100 to 500 from Canon. This I think is around 1.3 kilos. It's much, much smaller and much, much lighter. So if weight is a big issue, the 100 to 500 has a distinct advantage. However, if you really want this sort of range and you can't hand hold this, you could use a monopod. And it just so happens Sure sent me an SVM145, which is their brand new design. It's got some incredible engineering. And I've never seen this before, but you can expand it and retract it with one movement. It's absolutely incredible. It's very well built, it's sturdy, and I think this is one of the best monopods I've ever used. It also comes with one of those mini tripods that you can detach and use next to the ocean to get down nice and low. Put an MH100 Wimberley head on that, and you've got a range of movement, and it'll just be perfect if you can't handhold this lens. There's a link in the description with a discount if you're interested, so I will use that monopod in the future if you want to know more about it. And the lens is retractable, as I mentioned earlier, so it extends out when we're at 800mm, which makes it much, much longer. Some people might be worried about the dust and dirt and water getting into these extendable zooms, and that's fair given the history. The old dust pump, I think the 100 to 400s, had serious issues. But I've been told that the weatherproofing and drip and dust proofing <laughs> is the same as the 100 to 500, which is fantastic. So I'm quite confident that Canon have learnt over the years, and this lens should be fine. All right, so let's have a look at the actual design of the lens and what's actually included. And we'll start from this end and move down. The first thing I should mention is that the lens hood comes with the lens, so props to Canon. On their cheaper lenses, they often exclude it, so I'm happy to see a lens hood is included. One thing I did notice about the lens hood is it seems to scratch easily and attracts the dust. I don't know why, but just be prepared for your lens hood to get really, really dirty. So that's great that we've got that. Um, we now work down and we've got our big zoom ring here, which is nice and big, and it goes from 200 to 800. 
And that brings me to my biggest bugbear of this lens and it's a real weakness is the lens is quite stiff to turn. I mean it's not awful but if I'm hand holding like this and let's start at 200 I'm shooting one, two, three, four. So four turns to go from 200 to 800 which is quite a lot. And when I'm doing bird and flight I'm starting sort of around the 400, 500 millimeter range and if I want to go to 800 I've got a couple of turns and that's quite difficult to do when you're tracking a subject. So it's just hard on your thumbs and I use this in the field a number of times and after each session I actually had quite sore thumbs, almost RSI of the thumbs I think using this and it shouldn't be that way. I shouldn't be getting pain in my hand just from using this. So the stiffness of this zoom is just unfortunate and when you compare it to something like the Sony 200-600 the throw on this is absolutely beautiful. Like we've got 600-200. 600, 200. So if I hand hold it, it's basically from 400 to 600, it's one turn. You're just shooting and it's quite easy. It's very, very smooth. It's absolutely beautiful to use. And even the 100 to 500 throw, it's similar, but it's just nicer, I think. So overall, I would have preferred the zoom ring to not be as stiff. And that's probably one of the number one complaints I've heard from other users is they're finding it stiff as well. So we now move on to another complaint that I've got is this next ring here is a smooth, tight ring and if you saw my 100 to 500 video I think this is a waste of space and I don't like this idea. Basically on smooth, you have it on smooth, it's still tight. We move it to tight and now it's even harder to turn. I honestly don't know who would shoot with this on tight. It's obviously to stop um, barrel creep I suspect but even on um, even on the smooth setting, do we get a little bit of barrel? A little bit of barrel creep but not a lot. <laughs> I would have much preferred other lenses have a switch where you can lock the focal length. I just think it takes up a lot of space. And the issue is it's kind of in the very perfect place for a manual focus ring. But guess what? This lens doesn't have a dedicated manual focus ring. They've just eliminated it altogether. Instead what they've given us is a control ring which acts as a manual focus ring or a control ring, one or the other. You can't have both at the same time. And for me, that's a real bummer. You might be saying, well, why is that an issue? These lenses, these cameras, their autofocus is amazing. You don't need manual focus anymore. And that is partly true, but whoever has shot in a mirrorless body knows that it often locks onto the background. And when I'm shooting with the 100 to 500, it's got a dedicated manual focus ring. Whenever I lock onto the background, I can just quickly turn the manual focus ring and it pulls us back into focus. And when I'm shooting, say, dragonflies, I actually often use manual focus to get the subject into focus and then I engage AF. So I actually use the manual focus quite a bit. On this lens, it's just much, much harder to use because it's so small and the placement of it. It's quite a way back. So if I'm holding here and I'm turning the zoom ring and I want to get to the manual focus ring, it's very awkward to move my thumb all the way back here. It would have been perfect around where this tight zoom ring is. So, you know, that's just my personal preference. Maybe you don't care, but for me, I would have preferred a dedicated manual focus ring. Now, how do we switch from manual focus to uh, a control ring. There's now a dedicated switch that goes autofocus, control, and then manual focus. So you need to switch it from manual focus to control or autofocus. Uh, we do have lens function buttons, which is great, and you can use those and set them up for a whole range of different things. And that leads me on to the last thing I want to mention, and you can see this massive lens foot that is hanging out here, um, which we can turn around here it protrudes quite away and it is actually quite big. Now the downside to this is it's not removable. We cannot remove this tripod collar and lens foot like you can on the 100 to 500. Is that an issue? Well kind of it is because if you do hand holding all the time you don't need all this extra weight and this bulk going on here. The other thing is is that we cannot remove this lens foot. We can't put an aftermarket foot like we can with the Sony. So on the Sony you can remove the lens foot and put on a third party um, foot like I have here with an Arca Swiss built in. On the Canon you can't do that so what do we do? We have to use an aftermarket plate. So we have to attach a plate to this because they don't have Arca Swiss built into the foot. Now my advice is, thankfully there is two holes on the bottom of this lens foot. I would advise getting a lens plate that has the dual bolt. 
because if you use dual bolts, it's far less likely to move. Because I know a lot of people have problems with their lens moving on their plate. Just get one with two bolts and you'll be fine. And when you travel, uh, it's just a bit awkward to put it in your bag because you've got this massive lens foot coming out. And the other thing, <laughs> I sound like I'm complaining here, but the, the, just these little things that would make a difference. The other thing it's missing is it has no notch when you're going from portrait to landscape. So on many other lenses, you can feel it go click when you get back to um, landscape, you go to portrait and then come back and we often get a click. On this, we don't get it. You've got to actually visually look it up, line it up and then lock it off. So overall, I actually do love this lens. The feel of it's fantastic. The reach is great. It feels good in the hand. It's just those little things that I mentioned that could have been improved to make it even better. But overall, I'm very happy with the lens so far. It's also important I mention that this does have a variable aperture. Well, again, what does that mean? It means when we start at 200 millimeters, we have an aperture of 6.3. And as we zoom out, our aperture changes. The important one is what is it at 600 millimeters? Well, at 600 millimeters, it's F8. So it's two thirds of a stop slower than the Sony and the Sigma, etc. It's not until we sort of get closer to 800 that we drop to F9. So just something to be aware of. So I just want to quickly spend a little bit of time on focal range because that's the biggest feature of this lens to go from 200 to 800. What does that look like? What are the advantages of 800 millimeters? Well, I happen to be driving down the road. I'm looking out my window. I see a pipit, just a little brown bird jump up onto a fence post. And I thought this would be a great time just to show you the different focal range. So at 200 millimeters, I've taken a shot. And as you can see, the subject's quite small. We can see the fence. We can see the trees in the background. That's 200 millimeters. But just by turning this zoom ring all the way to 800, we now have a much bigger bird. The background has come out of focus because we've compressed the scene. We've pulled that background in. The detail is fantastic. And it's amazing to be able to change your composition like that, to have a wide 200 millimeter and then into 800 millimeters, just means when you're out in the field and you see a bird in a tree or whatever, you can go out to that 800 mil and make that subject so much bigger. It really, I, I can't emphasize just how important that is. And I can clearly show the difference between 500 mil, the 100 to 500 and the 200 to 800. I took this comparison of Gary the Galar and you can see that at 800 mil, the subject's just way, way bigger. Your detail's gonna be better, your background is going to be more compressed. Um, <laughs> you can tell that I really do like that extra focal length. And recently I shot a video with the R7 and remember the R7 has the 1.6 crop factor. So our field of view, I call it field of view, it could be equivalent focal length, whatever terminology you use. Basically when we're using the R7, we look through the viewfinder. When we're at 800 millimeters, it looks like a 1280 millimeter lens on a full frame. So it means that the subject is just enormous. I had some magpies singing they were a long way off. I don't know how far away they were, 30, 40 meters maybe, but I could frame it quite well, enable me to get this shot. And I just doubt I would have been able to get that shot with say this, this 500 millimeter lens on a full frame. It just gives you a lot of options. And something worth mentioning, because we have all this focal length, what I'm noticing, and many of you will probably notice this as well, is I'm starting to see the impacts of heat haze or shimmer whatever you want to call it, more in the field. What am I talking about? If you've ever taken photos and nearly every single one is soft, you cannot get a sharp shot and you're thinking, what is going on? Sometimes it could be this thing which we often call as heat haze. You often see it in the middle of the day in very hot areas, you'll see this waviness going on and it just wrecks your photos. But I wasn't aware that it can happen in a lot of different environments, cold, warm, in the morning, in the afternoon. What causes it? Well, if you watched my previous video, I've, I lost an entire morning session almost because all my images were ruined. What happened is the sun heated up the water, the air above the water was quite warm. We had a really cold night, so the cold air has come down and it's hit the warm. So we've got a difference in the temperature and the layers of air, which has caused the different reflection, which has caused this waviness and it's just ruined the photos. So it's something you need to be aware of. There is one tip that I want to mention is my beautiful subscribers mentioned to me that what can happen is if you're inside a vehicle and you've got say the heater on and so inside the car is hot but outside the car is really cold you've got that difference in temperature and if you've trapped the warm air in your lens hood you put it on you put it out the window and you try and shoot through the warm air into the cold air you're going to get heat haze you're going to get some serious issues so what you need to do is turn the heater off and try and get the temperature as close to possible inside the car as outside the car. Make sure your lens hood is off and acclimatized to the outside temperature. Lean out the window and shoot, and hopefully that will reduce your heat haze. But you could get engine temperatures and other things impacting. So often I will turn the vehicle off, make sure the windows are down, it's all the same temperature, lean out, 
take a photo like I did of this Nanking Kestrel. It's taken from the vehicle, the image is nice and sharp. That's how you can try to reduce heat haze. Also shooting in the morning or in the afternoon, late afternoon often helps. All right, so I've been talking quite a bit about the lens itself. It's time to show you some amazing photos to show you what's possible with this lens. That's what I'm interested in. What sort of photos can we get? You know, you can talk about specs all day, but I think the photos are sort of proof of the pudding, so to speak. So let's have a look at some of my images and some of my beautiful members and subscribers. We'll start with theirs first, and we'll start with an image that absolutely blew me away. The first image is of this incredible short aired owl by Sven. I think he was shooting in Denmark. This flight shot is everything you want in a photo. The detail's fantastic, the pose is great, the eye contact's good, you couldn't ask for more. What surprised me is this was actually shot at ISO 6400 at 2500th of a second. So obviously some good processing there with noise reductions, brought this image up a treat and shows you just what's possible with this lens, even in not the best light. The next image, I really like this intimate portrait that Florian took of a ruddy shell duck. The snow below, the snow around just frames this image and there's so much to like about this. Now in his words he said, the autofocus and stabilization has been a blast and this lens is well balanced and light enough to handhold. And the weaknesses he mentioned were very similar to mine. He wished it had a dedicated manual focus ring and the placement of the control ring could have been better. Here's another image shot in less than ideal conditions by Kenneth. He's managed to freeze the rain at a slow shutter speed of 1 200th. I like this image. It's worked wonderfully and he is very, very happy with it. So far he doesn't really have any complaints and he said the autofocus and the sharpness is almost equivalent to his 100 to 500. So a good little review there. The next image by Thomas of a yellow rump warbler. I like this image just because it blends into its environment. The bird is nice and sharp. And overall, I just thought it complements it. So in terms of the pros, Thomas said he loves the extra reach over his Sigma, the autofocus is a big improvement, and he loves the image stabilization. So again, some really positive remarks. Now I know a lot of people shoot bird in flight, and I want to share a couple taken with this lens. The first one by Ron of these swans. I just love the composition here. We've got the two birds, they're nice and sharp. Just the exposure is fantastic, the pose is great. And I just want to share Ron's pros and cons. He said he likes the price, he likes the zoom range, he likes the speed of the AF, the accuracy of the tracking, and the build quality are all fantastic. His cons, I'm thinking you can guess what they are. He said the throw of the zoom, the tripod foot not being removable, and he said the lens isn't totally weather sealed like some other lenses. Sticking with bird and flight, here's a beautiful shot of a red kite banking in the early morning blue light. This is by Manuel and he just loves the pose. He said he loves the autofocus, loves the image stabilization and overall the feel of it and he's getting some cracking results. So overall after receiving heaps of images I was so impressed. Lots of different conditions. The sharpness was always excellent. Even this dollar bird by Graham you can see the image is just nice and sharp. We had low light, we had sunlight, we had bird in flight the isolation of the subject. These images just speak volumes of what you can get from this lens. Now let's have a look at a few images that I took with the lens. I'll share you some of my favorites. First one is of this beautiful pink robin. I had a great session with my mate Jan. This is one of my favorite birds in Australia. It's just unbelievable that we get this beautiful pink breast. This beautiful image was actually taken on the R7 and this 200-800 at around 640th of a second F10. Just couldn't be happier with this. I just love everything about it. The detail has held up extremely well. Now the next image highlights that you can take good photos in bad light. I happened to be out with the R6 mark too. I saw a whistling kite, it was overcast, it was very grey and dull, but I took this shot because I like the composition, I like the way that the branches sort of match the bird and the bird's just sitting there, the bird pops. Overall I just like the layout and composition of this shot. And the next is one of my favourite shots I've taken, that was with the 200 to 800 plus a 1.4 converter. We had some action again, I was with my mate Jan, we had the silver gull attacking the crested turn and all of this action, we've shot bursts of images which has ended up with this shot here. So it goes to show what you can get with this lens and that converter. Now I'm definitely no landscape photographer and I wouldn't say this is a dedicated landscape lens, but at 200 millimeters you can take some landscapes and you can zoom in and sort of frame intimate portions of the landscape. Now as many of you know I live on a mountain and I get a beautiful view in the morning. This one particular morning we had a beautiful rich red sunrise. I've taken it out, I've hand held just at 200 millimeters, 1 80th of a second, so the image stabilization's kicked in and we got this shot that I'm very, very happy with. So <laughs> even hand held you can get some landscape shots with this setup. And the next shot just shows the beauty of this lens. You know, I'm just walking around in the bush, hand holding, I spot a mother kangaroo and a younger joey just standing there, quickly frame the shot, 
took off a burst, the kangaroos were gone. So in that very small amount of time, I captured this image, which I'm very happy with. It's just a nice little intimate scene of the mum and the joey in the Australian bush and just typical of what you expect with this lens. Now whilst this lens doesn't have the amazing minimum focus distance of the 100 to 500, you can still take images of reptiles and spiders and things. One morning uh, on my morning walk, I've spotted a spider in a spider web and it was had the light, the, but behind it was in shadow. So you know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna photograph this spider with a dark background. And that's what I did. You can see here, I got to minimum focus distance, focused on the spider, took the shot. And as you can see, we created this interesting composition. We've got the spider's web, we've got the spider, the detail's fine, and I didn't have to crop it that much. So again, you can see the versatility that I'm showing here. So I can't help but take photos of the moon with these long lenses, because I just love seeing how much detail I can get in the craters. And this one is no exception. You can see here at 800 millimeters, the detail is fantastic. You can see the big craters. I've got no complaints so far about the image quality and the reach, it's just great. And it's also a wonderful lens from shooting from the car, as I've already mentioned. The last photo I wanna share was an Eastern Rosella on a fence, just an old rusty wire fence. I've just stopped the car, lens out the window, took a shot, the bird flew off. Happy days, we've got the photo. Just makes um, birding you know, so much more fun when <laughs> you have that sort of reach. This lens is compatible with RF extenders, the 1.4 and two times. I tried this lens with the 1.4 quite a bit, had a full session with my mate Jan photographing crested turns, and it performed very, very well, better than I anticipated. Now, you do lose a stop of light, so you go from F9 to F13, so it's a 280 to 1120 F13. That's an incredible focal range, um, but we do lose that stop of light, so you're gonna need really good light. So why did I use this 1.4 converter? Well, we were at this crested turn colony, and we were trying to photograph intimate scenes of the chicks and the parents, and then swap to bird and flight. So we're going between the two. Now, it did work well at those portraits. You can see here this crested turn. The detail's great, we had nice intimate moments. However, if I'm being completely honest, it was a waste of time using this for bird and flight. I shouldn't have used it, I should have just taken it off. Why do I say that? because the more focal length you get, the harder it is to find the subject in the sky. So I'd often zoom out to sort of 500 millimeters or, and then try and track the subject. And because of the stiff zoom, I never got it really out to 1120. I wasn't taking advantage of the 800 to 1120. Nearly all my shots were less than 800 mil. So I should have just had the extra light and not even bothered. However, we made that choice just because we wanted, didn't want to take it on and off to photograph the portraits but if I was doing bird and flight, I wouldn't be using the 1.4 converter. What's the detail like? Well, I did take this Cape Barren Goose up close with the 1.4 converter, and as you can see, nothing wrong with the detail. Got really good light here, which obviously helps. Some people said, oh, should you use a two times? In my opinion, I wouldn't advise using a two times. You could, but you're gonna need so much light and there's gonna be issues. I did you take this portrait with a two times and it looks okay, but again, these are perfect conditions. So I wouldn't be rushing out and buying a two times. If you've already got one, perhaps you could try it, but it's not something I will be using myself. Okay, so I've talked about the lens, I've shown you some images, and now I just wanna talk about a few concerns that people have raised. First one being, what are our backgrounds gonna look like at F9? Is it a valid concern? Well, yes it is, because as you're aware, the higher our aperture, so if we go from 5.6 up to nine, the more depth of field we have, so the less out of focus your background will be. I can demonstrate this, I actually took a shot with my big prime lens, I was at 700 millimeters, 5.6, and we compare that to the 800 millimeter F9, and you can see there's a big difference. Those big prime lenses just smooth out that background, and they just look absolutely incredible. An F9 lens is never gonna be quite as good as those primes. However, how does it compare against some of these other zoom lenses, like the Sigma, Sony, and even this 100 to 500? Well, I did some tests, so let's have a look. Now, if we shoot at 600 millimeters, we're obviously at F8 on this lens, and we're at 6.3 on the Sigma, there's just more depth of field with the Canon lens. However, when we zoom out to 800 millimeters, we've got 200 millimeters more focal length, which compresses the scene, brings that background in, makes it look like it's out of more out of focus, and you can see when we compare the two shots, the backgrounds look very, very similar. And because we have 800 millimeters, I really didn't have a lot of issues getting that background separation. In fact, I actually liked the way that it looked. I took this wound bull shot. This is at F9, there's nothing wrong with the separation. We still get some definition in the background, which I really, really like. So I, I personally did not have an issue with F9. Now, if you do photograph a subject and the background's right behind it, 
you're not going to get an out of focus background. You can see that with the superb fairy ran. I took this shot, but we've got all the reeds in behind. They're never going to go out of focus, even with my big lens. So if you want out of focus backgrounds, you have to isolate that subject. A subscriber that did that perfectly is Danilo. He took this beautiful Anna's hummingbird. I love the color, love the pose, love the eye contact, but look at that background. It's completely out of focus. They've obviously achieved that because that perch had nothing directly behind it which resulted in that beautiful background. Just another example of a beautiful image taken with this lens. All right, the other major concern is, can we shoot this lens in low light? Because of the F9 aperture, people are really concerned that they're not gonna be able to get very good shots. Is that a valid concern? Yes, it is, because as I've already mentioned, due to F9, higher ISO, lower shutter speeds. So what are we gonna do? Ultimately, you just have to use really slow shutter speeds, take advantage of the image stabilization to try to reduce that ISO. However, Sometimes you're just gonna get bad shots. And this is probably one of the biggest mistakes beginners make is they will shoot in really low light, high ISO, and then they crop heavily. They look at the image and think something's wrong with their lens or their camera. I've got an example to show you. I was in the field, it was low light. I was trying to photograph a brown tree creeper. I underexposed it slightly. And when we crop in, you can see it's awful. There's no detail in this. It's a throwaway image. And you might think, oh, this lens is hopeless. However, I then had another opportunity where I got much, much closer to the brown tree creeper, and we can see when we compare them, this other image is just way, way better. Much better details, it's sharper, and that's because we got much closer. Admittedly, I probably had slightly better light, but ultimately, if you want to shoot in low light, you've got to get close to your subject, shoot low shutter speeds, and just hope for the best. Now, you're never going to be able to shoot action in low light. It's just going to be impossible. Your ISO would just be way too high. So it's just a reality that you need to accept. Now, I did take a shot in my backyard of a kangaroo before the sun came up. I used a really slow shutter speed here. And you can see once we edit this, it looks fine. There's no real major issues here. So the other day I noticed this beautiful Jezebel butterfly. It was sort of resting on a tree. The sun hadn't quite come up. Again, I've got the lens out, got to minimum focus distance, rattled off a number of shots, really slow shutter speed, and you can see that it's sharp and it's usable. So I think you just need to accept if you shoot in low light, use those slow shutter speeds. And I just want to share one comparison. A lot of people ask me to compare the Sony in low light to the Canon in low light, and will the 6.3 have an advantage? So that's what I did. I shot the Sony at f6.3. We had an ISO of 5000. I then used the Canon using the same shutter speed. The aperture now f9, we had an ISO of 10,000. And when you look at them side by side, we can see that the Sony image has a lot less noise, it had more light reaching the sensor. So you might be thinking, oh, the Sony is a definite winner here. But again, like I mentioned earlier, if we have to zoom in on the Sony image, we see a lot more noise and it loses some of that advantage. I guess the benefit with the Sony lenses is we can actually put a 1.4 converter on that, which gives us a very similar focal length at f9. But if we are able to get close to the subject, we can remove that teleconverter and we can have that benefit of the 6.3 aperture. Another concern that many people probably aren't aware of is how do those lack of coatings impact the images that we're seeing? Something that I had noticed and something that Jan noticed more than I did was this lens doesn't seem to handle bright highlights as well as say the 100 to 500. For some reason, it seemed to blow the whites a little bit quicker. And I don't know what's causing that, but we definitely saw it in the field. So like this pink robin shot, the exposure is fine. However, the bright parts of the perch, I almost lost all the detail there and I didn't expect that. Now I was able to recover them, but they went brighter than I anticipated. What I thought I'd do is I'd take a shot with the 100 to 500 and a shot with the 200 to 800. I overexposed both images by two stops, the exact same settings. However, when we recovered those highlights in post, you can see that the 100 to 500 actually has slightly better, what appears to be dynamic range, as in we got the highlights slightly better. Again, I don't know what's causing this, and there's a massive disclaimer here that we don't know what the T-stops are of this lens and this lens. So this lens may be letting in more light at the same shutter speed, which may result in a brighter photo. I don't know, but just anecdotally, it appears that in bright light or tricky light, this lens does appear to struggle a little bit, more so than these other lenses. Will that be a massive issue in the field? Not really, I just underexpose my images slightly, just being aware of that potential to blow your highlights. And some other reviews have mentioned some chromatic aberration. I didn't really see any evidence of that in all the photos that I took. I mean, if you pixel peep, you can probably see it, but in the real world, I don't think it's gonna be a massive issue. As these zoom lenses do lose focal length, the closer we get to the subject, 
thinking, what am I talking about? Well, if you have a prime lens like this 800 f11, this is an 800 millimeter lens, this is an 800 millimeter lens. When I shot them both from the same distance, I think I was seven meters away from the subject, you would expect them to have the same reach or the same field of view, but that's not the case. The prime lens doesn't lose its focal length as quickly. And you can see this is at 800, this is at 800, but the prime is much, much bigger. The prime has a distinct advantage when you get close to the subject. Admittedly, you can only get up to six meters distance with this lens. However, prime lenses just have that inherent advantage. Now the Sony is traditionally quite bad at when you get close to the subject and at about seven meters, I was surprised that they're actually very, very similar. But when we got really close, that's when the Sony sort of lost more focal length and this had a slight advantage. And just to demonstrate that, I put the converter on the Sony. So I was at 840 millimeters on the Sony. I was at 800 millimeters on the Canon. And when we look at them, they're almost identical. They almost have the same field of view. Maybe the Sony has a slight edge, but it was interesting that uh, with the converter, these lenses are almost identical. All right, it's time for us to compare this to other lenses. Let's first think about the lenses that are available for the RF mount. We start with the 100 to 400, which I have here. I've done a review on this, love this lens. It's nice and affordable, very small, very light. And then we go up to the 600 and 800 F11 lenses. So again, we're going in price here. This here is that prime lens. And then we come to the Canon 200 to 800, which fits here in terms of price. And then obviously we go to the 100 to 500, which is more expensive, but has less focal range. Those are the five wildlife lenses that are available sort of under that 3000 US price. Which one is right for you? Well, I like to break these down into two types of lenses. The first type are our little shorter zooms. They're 100 to 500, 100 to 400. These fit a specific purpose. They're all round lenses. They're like, you know, a 100 to 400 on steroids, this one, you can do up close, you can do macro, you can do landscape, but they're too short for small birds. 400 millimeters and 500 millimeters is just too short. And that's when we jump into our 600 millimeter plus lenses. So the 800 lenses, they're ideal for smaller wildlife, small birds, etc. To show you the difference between 400 millimeters and 800 millimeters, we can see it on the screen. There is no comparison. This is just much, much shorter. And on a full frame body like the R6 or the R5, Honestly, it's just probably a little bit too short. However, we now get to the 800 millimeters and these are just much, much better. So it comes down to your budget. It comes down to the weight, the sort of subjects you shoot. If you're an all rounder, I would suggest the 100 to 400 or the 100 to 500, depending on your budget. However, if you photograph small birds, I would likely advise the 200 to 800 or the 800 F11. And again, depending on your budget. Some of you are probably saying, oh, why can't we just use a 1.4 on the 100 to 500? And you can, and that's probably one of the, the most requested comparisons I got asked to make. Can we just buy the 100 to 500 1.4 converter? So we're at 700 millimeters F10 versus 800 F9. What is the difference? So let's have a look at the differences between these two lenses. First is obviously the price. This here is a thousand dollars more expensive at a converter. And we're looking at $1,500 more expensive for the 100 to 500. When we add the 1.4 converter to the 100 to 500, we lose the 100 to 300 range. So it becomes a 420 to 700 F10 versus 200 to 800 F9. This clearly has a lot more range and is far more versatile. In terms of its size, obviously this one wins out big time. It's much lighter and much, much smaller. Now, in terms of the autofocus, this has two autofocus motors. This has one. This is going to have a clear advantage. The big one, though, I guess, is well, what is the actual image quality like? What does it actually look like? So I did exactly that. I took a shot at 700 F10, 800 F9. Here's the comparison. Obviously, 800 is bigger than 700. When we zoom in, I would say wide open, the 700 F10 may have a very, very slight advantage. However, when I stop this down to F10, so 800 F10, they are virtually identical. I think when you use a converter, there's not going to be that much difference in image quality between these two. So if you already own the 100 to 500 and you've got the 1.4 converter, then that's probably completely fine. However, if you want an additional reach, then this is a great option. For me, if you were to say to me, Dwayne, pick one, would you pick the 100 to 500 or the 200 to 800? For me, I'd say I want both because <laughs> they serve two different purposes. But if I had to make a choice, because I photograph small birds the majority of the time, I would go with the 200 800. It's just more versatile and has more reach. However, this is the better lens. 
it is sharper without the converter. It's an L series lens. This is just a wonderful lens. So it really comes down to the weight and what you shoot. But of interest, you can buy the 200 to 800 and the 100 to 400 for cheaper than you can buy the 100 to 500. So perhaps that's an option. The next obvious comparison is the Zoom 800 versus the Prime 800. And there are a few differences. Obviously, this one is a Zoom range, so 200 to 800. It's twice as expensive. This one's half the price. The, this one is much heavier. This is much lighter. Obviously, this has a six meter minimum focus distance. This is 2.8, so you can get much closer with this lens. It has a variable aperture. It's faster at f9 versus f11. So there are a number of advantages to the zoom lens. You also get full AF coverage in the older bodies. This lens here on the R5, you get a tiny autofocus box, which makes it a little bit harder. So what advantages does this lens have? Well, it has that extra reach that I mentioned. It's The subject's gonna be bigger with the prime lens. It's half the price as mentioned and the autofocus is potentially slightly better in tricky situations. It doesn't have as many moving parts. It's a prime lens. They tend to autofocus just that little bit better. But for me, I'm probably gonna be choosing the 200-800 just because of its versatility. The next comparison we need to make is with probably the most popular DSLR zoom range lens on the market, and that is the Sigma 150-600 Contemporary. Thanks to my mate Brian for lending this to me. I love this lens, did a review on it. I think it's very sharp. So if you own this lens and you've been holding off and holding off, is it worthwhile upgrading to this lens? In my opinion, yes it is. You get 200 millimeters extra reach. The autofocus is vastly improved. The image stabilization is far superior. Overall, I think it's a bit of a no-brainer to upgrade to this lens. How's the image quality? Well, when we look at them at 600 millimeters, they're virtually identical again. The Sigma is quite sharp. However, when we go out to 800 mil, it just has that advantage. So again, I still love this lens. If you have DSLRs, I suggest this one, but if you've got a mirrorless body, I think now is the time to jump up to this 200 to 800. The last comparison that we have to make is obviously the Sony 200 to 600 versus the 200 to 800. I know it's kind of pointless making this comparison because one's Canon and one's Sony, but it's just interesting to see the differences between the two. Obviously, the pricing's very similar, sizing's very similar, weight's very similar. The IQ, again, very, very similar. Here's a comparison at 600 mil versus 600 mil. Obviously, it's quicker at 6.3, but again, we've got an extra reach. We've got the 800 versus 600. Now, some of you are probably saying, well, we can use a 1.4 on the Sony, and yes, you can. You go to 280 to 840 F9, and as I mentioned earlier, they're almost identical in reach. And the other thing that we need to take into account is we put a 1.4 extender on this lens, 1120 versus 840, again, you get way more reach. So if reach is what you're after, <laughs> the Canon has that in spades. Obviously the next important thing is its autofocus ability, really important for wildlife. And to be honest, it's performed well. I've taken loads of action shots, flight shots. You can see the EVF here of it tracking flying birds. When we had good contrast, this lens performed very well. So those crested turns, not an issue whatsoever. However, when we had peregrine falcons and the contrast wasn't quite as good, I must admit the autofocus did struggle a bit. Now I shot with the 200 to 800 and the 100 to 500 at the turn colony, and the 100 to 500 just performed better in my opinion. It was just a little bit snappier, and you would expect that with the extra autofocus motor. So it's not bad, it's just not quite as good as the L series. It's definitely a jump up from the Sigma, and I don't think you're gonna have any issues, and those people that have bought this lens have commented to me that they're finding the autofocus to be excellent. One important thing I wanna mention is the AF performance on the R7. If you are new to the channel, my R7, for whatever reason, gives me some autofocus issues with any lens I use. It seems to lose focus on and off, and I get lots of blurry shots. I sent it to Canon, they said there's nothing wrong with it, so I just deal with it. I had the same issues with this 200-800. I would shoot a burst, some would be sharp, some would be soft, it would come on and off. I was able to get plenty of sharp shots, don't get me wrong. I took some lovely images with the R7. I just want to be real that my experience was this lens performed much better on the R5 and the R6 Mark II. Now just to demonstrate the autofocus, a couple of members sent me some cracking flight shots. Tony sent this buffle head duck. The reflection's wonderful, the wing position's wonderful, and he said the lens just tracked this duck as it was flying across the water, which is exactly what we want. Another shot freezing the action was from Joseph of this common Meganza. Again, he's managed to freeze the action as the bird's flying past. And then for me, I managed to shoot a backlit 
egret as it's flying into the sun and the lens just tracked that without issue and we managed to get this photo. So overall I was happy with the lens's autofocus ability um, for its price and everything else it's, it's not a major. Obviously the image stabilization I already mentioned how good it is I think it has 5.5 stops of IS it is magic. I can't believe how steady this is at 800 mil like credit to Canon you've done a wonderful job um, you can definitely hand hold this at low shutter speed as I've mentioned 1 50th 1 100th or even slower so even handheld video is possible with this here's some handheld footage that I took you can definitely use this handheld without an issue the image stabilization is just excellent so which camera should you buy for this lens well any RF mount camera will work Canon's obviously got a range of APS-C and full frame bodies I used the R7 the R6 II and the R5 enjoyed all of them got great shots with all of those bodies obviously the question is well how different is the R7 from the R6 II the R7 has our 32 megapixels the R6 has our 24 I took a shot side by side and you can see that the field of view of the R7 is just ridiculous it just makes that subject enormous and when we zoom in it's just got so many pixels on the subject one thing I was happy about is I think this lens now makes the R6 II the R8 much more feasible for wildlife like these 100 to 500s on those bodies for me was just too short but now with the R6 Mark II I felt quite fine just using this as a 200-800 I felt like I had a lot more reach and I was very happy with that experience again we can use a 1.4 if you want more but I think this lens is going to work fine on any of those Canon mirrorless bodies all right well that brings me to the conclusion what are my overall thoughts of this lens they're very positive I think anybody who buys this lens will be very happy you're going to take amazing photos with it I've been very happy with it I will continue to use it it's versatility means that if I don't want to use my big prime lens this is probably the one going into my backpack if I'm traveling or just going around the car this is going to be next to me whack it out take shots and away you go 200 800 wonderful focal range the build quality is excellent so many things to love about it is it perfect no it's not it's obviously I've already mentioned the issues the zoom the stiff zoom the lack of manual focus there's a few things that could have been improved and I wish they had been improved but it's not going to stop me from enjoying this lens and it's not going to stop me from recommending it to you yes the f9 is a bit of a bummer and you do need to take that into consideration if you shoot in a low light but as I mentioned low shutter speeds or slightly higher ISO to help overcome that but overall I just think this is an excellent option if you do small birds you do wildlife maybe aviation surfing anything where you want that subject bigger this could be the lens for you and on Canon I don't think there's a better option than this now what I would absolutely love is if you are fortunate to own this lens jump down to the comments give us your pros and cons other people love to read other owners views not just youtubers like myself the best reviews come from existing owners so please get down there make sure to jump down to the comments read those comments thank you very much thank you to all the members that sent in images and subscribers sorry I weren't I wasn't able to show them all I will show more at this end of this video but overall it was just a wonderful experience I'm very happy with all those images thank you for the support thanks to all the members that support the channel for less than the price of a cup of coffee you directly support me and you get access to the current digital calendar but this has been a long video it's been an enjoyable one to make I'm very happy can't wait to use this more in the field can't wait to see the photos that you've taken on this lens until the next one happy birding take care and see you later